So I want to get started, Aaron, with a look back before we look forward. Let's talk about the past 12 to 18 months in small caps. What have you seen and what were some of the drivers of performance? Well, post the election in November of 2016, there was really a, a resurgence of uh, value stocks uh, with the expectation that new policy would mean less regulation as well as more spending on infrastructure. And so those stocks had a nice run. Um, and that quickly um, subsided in 2017 and growth stocks took over. Uh, I think policy being uncertain and trying to work through what that actually means, um, uh, people started to focus on where there was really visible growth and when some of the innovation and technology areas uh, showing real resilient growth in terms of the way that we use technology in the workplace as well as in our personal lives, uh, those stocks uh, ended up performing quite nicely last year. Now, there was so much conversation around the time of the election that the Trump bump was a rally on the campaign promises versus the delivery. Do you think that most of that upside is already baked in for things like tax reform? It's very hard to tell. I, I still think you know the jury's still out in terms of what will go into place and how will that uh, benefit certain companies or certain companies will might be disadvantaged. Uh, it, it clearly we've seen uh, a positive impact from uh, tax reform, and that is real uh, incremental cash that's coming into these companies' pockets. And now we're waiting to see how companies decide to spend that cash. Do they return it to shareholders? Do they invest more in their own business? Or does that get competed away on the fact that they end up returning that back to their customers and trying to drive market share? Now, Aram, you are a growth manager. So mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about some of the drivers of growth, uh, growth's outperformance over the past year or so. Yeah, I think it goes back to, uh, you know, first of all, equ equities as an asset class have been an attractive place to put money because there aren't a lot of alternatives. And growth has been slow but consistent. And so money has flooded into equities. And then within that, uh, in terms of the areas that you can put money into, uh, as I was saying before, uh, growth has been the most visible in terms of their ability to uh, consistently deliver top line growth. Um, and, and then a lot of the growth companies have also seen consistent leverage within the business model too. So I think we've seen some transformations taking place within, specifically within technology, but in biotech as well, in terms of mapping the human genome. And some of these companies that were earlier in their development not only are showing levels of growth that um, are not slowing down to the level that people expected, but they're really starting to leverage the years of investment that they made in R&D and ramping up their sales force so that their margins and their cash flow levels are at a lo higher levels than what people originally expected, and that's what is helping propel stock prices. So that growth isn't necessarily predicated on macro themes, it's predicated on innovation and the investment in that up till this point. Correct. Sure, and Aram, how do you think a little bit about volatility here? So we also use volatility as a, as a tool to enter and exit positions. Um, when we do our work, we tend not to focus on valuation at the front end. We do our work in understanding what the innovative product or solution that the company is developing, the market that it fits into, um, focusing on the balance sheet and making sure that there's enough uh, capital to continue to grow that business and spend a lot of time talking to management. And we don't fixate on valuation until the very end once we have that full picture. Um, secondly, we also don't want to be biased. So we don't want to have a, a company that we're looking at that has a high or low number attached to it and that might bias our work as we're doing that due diligence. Uh, once we complete our work, we determine where we would get an asymmetric return by putting clients' capital to work. And so if we do our work and we determine that there isn't enough downside protection at today's level, we wait for that volatility to present itself to give us that entry point to buy at a very attractive level. Aaron, what do you think about this? So it, it's we focus mostly on stock specific and company uh, driven dynamics. Sure. Uh, with that said, uh, we are cognizant of the fact that um, there are macro factors at play in um, the supply and demand of our businesses that which we invest in. And uh, I think the biggest thing that kind of keeps us up at night are the things we can't control or that we uh, have little transparency into. And so the geopolitical climate is the one that uh, that we worry about. Um, and we, the way that we analyze that is we try and determine what are the likely outcomes and how would that proliferate through to our company's fundamentals. 
and then determining where those risks are within our companies, uh, having those conversations with the CEOs, CFOs of our, of our businesses, and determine are there certain levers in which our companies can pull on so that if they're impacted somehow, that maybe there's a way to dampen it and uh, turn it around to an opportunity. And it's interesting because markets have somewhat been immune to geopolitical risk and changes, but it could impact other things other than stock price. So it's important to have those conversations. Absolutely. There's always the unintended consequences with certain actions. Um, you know, the, the tariff is the, is the latest example of that, just how that ripples through, which countries are impacted. Is this really all about uh, base materials or does this have an impact on intellectual property? And sort of cycling that through and understanding how that could proliferate is important and critical to our process. Uh, at the end of the day, it comes back to the company fundamentals and how those might be impacted. So let's talk about the IPO window. And Aram, I'm going to start with you here. What role do IPOs play when you're sourcing new ideas? And, and what are some of the trends you're seeing in the new issue market? The IPO market is uh, a good avenue for us to discover new investment mm -hmm. ideas, as well as focus on and meet with companies that are potentially could be disruptive to the companies that we currently own. But we have found it as a great avenue to originally get our foot in the door uh, buying an initial investment on the initial public offering, and then building that up over time as liquidity improves. And the cycle sort of ebbs and flows depending on what's going on in the broader market. Um, we have found that usually at the beginning part when the uh, IPO window uh, opens, those companies that have been in backlog, uh, the best companies that have been in the waiting pen are the first ones to come out. So it's, it's you know, we're, we're, we're always meeting with private companies and being on the front edge of that. Um, right now, the, after a period of the window being closed, the, the, the IPO window is open. And I think we're seeing a good smattering of uh, high quality companies, uh, very innovative businesses, uh, down to the companies that are more in our steady camp of companies that are growing mid to high single digits in more of a more mature market, but taking considerable market share, improving their business, getting into adjacent markets and are able to grow earnings well into the double digits. So we think that uh, the, the pipeline is pretty rich of new ideas and it's been a fruitful area for us to uh, drive returns for investors. Okay, so I'm gonna move us from the bigger picture and you've kind of given us a nice opportunity to look at the, the macro and legislative items on the agenda that you're keeping an eye on and go more toward the opportunity set. So I'm gonna go down the line first. It'd be great just to get a primer on how you source opportunities for your portfolio and then we'll move into the sectors or areas or ideas that are really exciting for you right now. So Aram, just give us a quick introduction to how ClearBridge looks at opportunities. So ClearBridge focuses on quality businesses and by that, we uh, look at it both on a qualitative and quantitative perspective. From a qualitative perspective, we're looking for recurring businesses and investing with astute management teams that are investing shareholder capital wisely and have, have, have uh, driven good returns without stressing the balance sheet. From a quantitative perspective, our companies have higher returns, um, have uh, higher free cash flow yields due to, to, to the attractive valuations, and they deploy significantly less leverage. So that's kind of a, 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 a framework for what we're looking for. And then from there, specifically within the small cap growth and uh, mid, uh, mid growth strategies that we manage, um, looking for innovative product and solution based companies that are either going into a new marketplace and um, building it up themselves or going into an existing market where there's a sleepy incumbent and taking a tremendous amount of market share. Um, from there, we focus on the business model, the financial underpinnings, and we spend time with management of every company before we make an investment to understand what sort of levers they're pulling on today that are going to drive great economic returns for the investors that we're deploying their capital. So it sounds perhaps like innovation and disruption are, are big themes for you. That's a key element, okay. certainly. Aram, when you think about the universe of opportunities, what are some of the things that really stand out for you right now? So the strategy has had a heavy focus on technology, specifically software companies, and we still have a heavy weight in that space. However, valuations coming to the year were attractive and have significantly appreciated. So we're seeing slightly less opportunity there. 
and we've been trimming those positions and redeploying capital into a handful of companies, uh, new ideas as well as existing in the portfolio where those companies haven't executed as crisply as they had in the past. And we see an opportunity for execution to improve and drive earnings power uh, substantially higher with very attractive valuation. So we've been adding weight that area in the portfolio. Um, biotech is, uh, early stage biotech is not an area that we participate in due to the high level of risk and funding needs of those businesses. Um, and consumer is an area that uh, we're not necessarily uh, uh, have one direction or another on, as an opinion in terms of as an industry but it's been very hard and challenging for us to find new areas within consumer discretionary due to changing consumer behavior. It's now just commonplace to open up your phone and you know order lunch or order a car, and, and it's just an on-demand economy now, and that has challenged a lot of incumbent businesses and uh, a lot of pressures from people like Amazon. So uh, we're pushing hard to find new consumer discretionary ideas, but really struggling to find, out, find new, new, new businesses to invest in. Aaron, when you think about the, the universe of, of indicators that you look at at stocks whenever you're assessing an opportunity, what are some of the key elements that you're keeping an eye on? So we focus a lot on management teams because uh, those are the key decision makers that are driving the business forward. And uh, we think that's important for any company, but particularly in the small mid space, the CEO has a great impact in terms of product development, go to market. There's less key lieutenants that are driving that. So we spend a lot of time talking to management about what their plan is today, how their plans might change in the future if there's some exogenous factors or macro environment or competitive entry that they need to uh, adjust their business plans accordingly. And the last piece is how they're incented because uh, at ClearBridge, our portfolio managers have a tremendous amount of their net worth tied up in their own strategies. And so we live and die by our performance and we like to see the same thing with our management team. So we always dive into how is the management team compensated? Uh, what really motivates them every day to make the right decisions for our investors' capital? And Aram, for you, obviously you mentioned already that you have looked at companies where their research and development is really starting to yield innovation. Do you find that they're bullish about opportunities for the future? Yeah, we haven't seen any slowdown. Uh, I think the, the innovative companies continue to invest right through the downturn. Um, and so, you know, they had a good run in 2013, 14, and 15. And I think that's given them the confidence to continue to invest behind good products to create more products and expand the addressable markets for which they have. In our more, uh, in our companies that are in more mature industries, I think that we've seen them continue to put capital into new facilities and hire new um, uh, sales efforts internationally. Um, speaking to Bill's point, I think that the, 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 the international uh, growth picture has been improving the last 12 months. And, um, and so, they're, yeah, they're continuing to invest. Now, I want to stay on the active-passive debate. And Aram, I'm going to direct it to you. How do you think about active versus passive in the small cap space? So we think everyone should have a portion of their uh, savings and investment portfolio in small cap due to the fact that it is a, uh, an asset class that has outperformed, that grows more quickly. And uh, we think, though, it's very important to stay active. And that's because if you look at the index uh, for small cap companies, uh, roughly about a third of the companies are not profitable. And so you have a lot of companies that don't generate earnings, there's a fair amount of debt, and therefore the index tends to be lower quality than uh, if you invested with a, a quality manager. And it's, a, it's tended to be a more volatile asset class. Those companies don't have the same level of access to capital that large cap co companies do. And so you want companies uh, to be able to withstand uh, more challenging times, to always have uh, the available capital internally to reinvest in their business. And so therefore, it's important to choose active management who are going to invest in quality businesses over what's in the index. So we've touched on the macro opportunity set, specifically what you like. And then we've also talked about where small caps fit into a larger portfolio. But I want to know where each of your firms fit in. So Aram, kicking off with you, tell us about ClearBridge's competitive advantage. So we talked earlier that quality is really a hallmark of ClearBridge investing, and that cuts across all of our strategies. The other element is really the judgment and the patience that we have in um, our due diligence process in dissecting business models. 
in uh, looking through management teams and uh, making sure that there's the necessary balance sheets to support those future growth. And then once we have uh, performed that judgment on the business model and the investment, it's the patience required to wait for an attractive, compelling opportunity to put capital at risk.